Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining. Uh, my name is George Jim Shilley-Shvili, um, and uh, I have a foreign medical uh, degree. I work here as associate scientist for Dr. Levy, Dr. Dietrich, and Dr. Guest, help with studies in different ways, and I'm also one of the people who does the neurological exams for research. Uh, hopefully typed my last name correctly, but I didn't have too much time to check it. We'll do it later. I was busy with this presentation. So um, the presentation will be uh, a little bit different than the usual presentations um, on uh, Wednesday seminars. Um, it, it is um, made to be interactive. So I encourage anyone to ask questions as we go. Um, you can stop me. Um, and um, let me know to repeat something if something is unclear. And also I will be asking you questions. So I really encourage everyone to please participate in chat or if you would like to speak up, of course, that's also welcome. Um, now, um, another difference from uh, usual presentations will be that I'm not gonna be presenting um, uh, any um, results of, of the study or the data from the study, it will be mostly um, my personal experience and the difficulties that I have encountered with um, with the, uh, this exam that I'll be speaking about. And we'll also have sort of a mini training session uh, in the, as we go in the presentation. So the table of contents, I'll, I'll briefly touch the history, which I'm not a big uh, history buff, uh, but uh, just a small intro, but we'll spend um, a significant amount of time on how to do the exam and how uh, not to do the exam, uh, what to do, what what not to do, and a lot of it will be again just um, uh, my opinions and what I advise, but it wouldn't be um, absolutely um, accurate, maybe. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about the errors and difficulties, and that will be the section where you can ex expect the exercises or um, um, audience quiz, uh, I can say. So the brief history starts with um, initial standard and the standard um, exam wasn't really a standard, but it was um, one that was developed in 1969. It was called the Frankel um, scale or Frankel classification. And um, the idea of it was to, um, to, to describe spinal cord injury in um, uh, on on a different severity level, starting from A to E. So letters A, B, C, D, and E. A would represent the most severe injury, which would be called a uh, um, complete spinal cord injury. B, C, and D injuries or classification scales would be called incomplete injuries, various degrees of incompleteness. Um, and E would be the injury where uh, no detectable, uh, well, it would be a classification of spinal cord where no detectable injury is, is present. Um, so this um, scaling system um, worked as a, as a foundation for what now is called international standards for neurological classification of spinal cord injury. So long name, its abbreviation is INSCI. Uh, you can see here in bold. Um, and it was developed by American Spinal Injury Association, which has its abbreviation as ASIA. Now, this will be the entire talk. This particular exam uh, will be the um, entire focus of this talk. And the name in scheme now is, you know, even though it's a nice abbreviation of a long name, uh, it's not always the single name that is used to describe this exam, but uh, also ASIA. Um, the word Asia is the term that sometimes is used to describe this exam. And they're, they're used interchangeably and I'll be using them interchangeably. So I'll sometimes refer to it as Inski exam, sometimes to the Asia exam. Now, uh, the Asia exam or Inski was developed in uh, 1982, but was endorsed in 1992 by International Spinal Cord Society. And uh, the, you know, it, became a standard across the globe. Everyone started using it. Um, and uh, since it was implemented, it went many, many revisions. And the major ones were 2011 and 2019, the last revision, which I'll, I'll particularly speak about, but not, not in great detail. But if you'd like to know more details, here are the references. Um, firstly, about the Frankel scale. 
um, and also the 2011 and 19 references are, are here. Now, why did the uh, INSKI um, uh, or AJ exam become such a, a worldwide uh, adopted um, uh, exam? There are two reasons. One is scientific, another is practical. So scientifically, what um, Asia, you know, what, what studies have shown that using Asia or the INSKI um, uh, helped to um, differentiate um, between the prognosis. So when patients have um, or, or subjects have spinal cord injury, depending if they were initially graded as Asia A, which represents complete injury, or Asia B, which represents incomplete injury, their chances of um, developing motor recovery um, at the follow-up was significantly higher if they had an Asia B. Um, great. Now, we'll of course discuss what is um, Asia B uh, in detail and Asia A and all other grades as well. But just as introduction, this was the scientific purpose. But there were, of course, other um, uh, reasons as well. And these are practical examples why INSKI is, um, is a good exam or um, good enough exam. So it's it's uh, very inexpensive. You don't need any fancy equipment. You don't need any equipment except of a cotton um, swab and a safety pin. It's trainable. Um, I would say that it's easy to learn, hard to master, uh, but um, it, it's it's easily trainable. The certificate is easily obtainable. It takes only a few hours. There is a good training um, on the Asia website. That's only about fifty. Um, dollars um, uh, of cost and it's it has a global use in any scientific community you go um, anyone uh, that works with spinal cord will know about the Asia and uh, it's also part of the inclusion criteria in most of the studies it is reproducible or at least uh, should be um, and its metric properties are acceptable as outcome measures and they are outcome measures for uh, many, many studies worldwide, not only in, in the uh, North America. Now, because they um, are the outcome measures, the accuracy of the Asia exam is, is very important. And, um, you know, experience of the um, examiner is very important. And that's the reason, uh, one of the main reasons of um, me presenting it about it today. Now, why uh, I decided to do it is uh, due to amount of exams. Um, I was fortunate uh, to, to conduct thanks to uh, Miami project. Um, and uh, initially I started, um, I joined the study, um, which was um, called the hypothermia study, hypothermia treatment in spinal cord injury. The initial protocol started in 2006 and ran for 10 years. We enrolled, um, well, there were 54 patients in, enrolled in that study. I personally did only 31 exams. Um, then we did switch to the new uh, multicenter hypothermia protocol, which um, in 2017 it was initiated. And we started, we, we um, University of Miami, Miami Project, and Department of Neurosurgery being a lead. Um, site. We initiated it with uh, four um, um, four sites in total. Uh, there was uh, Thomas Jefferson, Indiana, and Emory University. And, but unfortunately, um, Indiana University couldn't continue participating, and um, we ended up being three. So we invited uh, Honor Health uh, Research Institute in Arizona, University of Maryland, University of South Carolina, and they all uh, agreed, accepted, and joined us. And now we our team of six with 56 uh, subjects and 26 of them were enrolled at Jackson and I performed 114 exams. This is the rare number that I actually counted. Uh, some others I didn't. Now, I've been very, very fortunate to be um, part um, of the North American Clinical Trial Network, um, uh, which uh, we also call NACTIN Registry. Uh, that Dr. Guest is an is, um, um, uh, important member of, and he is also the PI of the study that um, you know, we, we are a part of. And just at the University of Miami, we have enrolled 122 uh, patients. Uh, and this is um, likely the largest um, uh, database of 
the spinal cord injury starting from acute in North America. So not comparing to Europe, but in, in North America, we have over 1,000 patients who are actively working on that uh, data uh, right now. So I performed around 155 exams in that study. Now, result was also the, the great, uh, was the largest acute um, SEI interventional study in the world that had over 20 universities that it um, uh, covered um, or collaborated with. And Dr. Guest uh, was the PI there. We were able to enroll five patients and I performed 20 exams. This was a very, very tough exam. Uh, These 20 exams might have been not all 20, but uh, some of them were one of the, um, the toughest because of the strict inclusion criteria, criteria in the Relozole study. Uh, which is a medication that's approved by FDA for uh, the ALS. Um, but yes, so we had inclusion criteria. We had an, around 12 hours. We were supposed to administer the medication. And um, we also not only needed to perform the full INSCI exam, which again, we'll cover in detail, uh, we also had to obtain uh, blood draws, look at the labs, make you know calls and, um, and so on, analyze blood and you know, extract serum, et cetera. So now internally uh, in the Miami project, um, Department of Education run, is running the Asia study. And what we do in that study is we um, invite anyone f uh, with spinal cord injury to come and uh, join our community. And we uh, perform the protocol in this manner. We ask subjects what they know about their spinal cord, how much they know about their level of injury, Asia grade, uh, and then we examined them. And I actually did count this number in February. I was preparing this uh, presentation and it was 112 since then, maybe four or five more patients than uh, I've examined. Uh, Dr. Neil Dada is joining me with uh, the study. We do uh, many exams together. And um, um, yeah, so we, we're advancing our experience. Now, brain key study is also one uh, study that involved um, the age exams is involving. We're still uh, enrolling in, in, in that study. We have nine subjects screened, five enrolled at the UM and run 15 exams. Now, Schwann cell studies, I'm sure most of you are uh, familiar about, you know, with them, uh, heard about them. Um, eight subjects were, were um, enrolled. There were more enrolled, but there were some that screen failed and didn't um, end up in the final uh, reports, but uh, yes, participated a little bit uh, in those um, exams as well um, on my own. Uplift study is the current study that we started um, somewhat recently, uh, where we used the transcutaneous electric stimulation at the level of the injury and we have two patients enrolled for now. It's very, very work intensive. Uh, we had two screen failures and five pre-screen failures as we were looking for potential candidates to, to screen them. Uh, and about 11 exams uh, were performed there by myself there. So the resident and student trainings, I approximate that at, at, at 50 might be more, might be less. Uh, and yeah, training is a big, big part of, of this exam. Now, um, the, uh, going through the table connects, uh, we'll switch to how to do this exam, and I'll try to go over this in, um, in a calm and in a slow fashion. If I go over it too fast, please let me know, and I'll adjust my speed. Um, just as an intro, it might look, if you haven't seen this exam or this form yet, it might look complicated, but we'll break it down. And this is just a form uh, that I want to demonstrate. Um, and I'll talk about um, each of the details um, as we progress. Uh, so this all, this parts of this form, all of it needs to be filled out and there are set rules to, to do them. To, uh, also give a, another big picture. This is also a big picture uh, that I'll uh, break down apart. Um, it, uh, it, the exam can be divided into, um, uh, into three major compartments. The sensory uh, examination, the muscle testing, and the rectal exam. Rectal exam we can also include with the sensory exam, but it's a very big part of the overall exam. So that's why we sort of uh, group it separately as a third part. So 
how do how to start the exam? Well, we always start with a, with a sensory part first, although I'm not sure if it's a particular rule that a sensory has to be first, but always have done um, the sensory first. So this is all you need. You need a code and swap and, uh, and a safety pin, and that's it, and knowledge and a bed, uh, uh, preferably. Um, so we start with a light touch and we take a code and swap. Code and swap is used to assess light touch. The, the pin prick um, is assessed with the safety pin. So sharp and dull sensation is assessed with the safety pin. So for the light touch, we take the corner swap and we, we swipe it on subject's forehead, or we can use a cheek as well. And we tell them, this is your baseline. What you feel now, they should feel normal. And as we expect that there is only spinal cord injury and no other injuries, no TBI, no other stuff. Um, that's a normal sensation. So we ask them, remember the sensation. And now I'll go through different areas of your body. And uh, uh, please tell me if you feel the touch as, um, as the same touch in other location compared to the forehead. If you feel it differently, or if you don't feel it, we'll establish that. Now, the points that we go through, well, I need to talk about them a little bit more. Um, these points that you see here, these red dots, they represent each dermatome, but not the full dermatome. As one dermatome can be uh, quite large, and um, uh, in order to make the uh, exam more um, standardized, the individual dermatomes uh, point was designed to be, you know, um, particular spot. So, for example, the C2 dermatome will be checked only at that location, you know, two centimeters below, be behind the, the ear. Um, the C4 will be at the acromioclavicular joint. And, um, you know, all these dermatomes, they have a set definition where you'll be checking them. And, both the light touch and the pimp ring will be, will be checked at each of the dermatomes if possible. Now, sometimes the dermatomes might not be accessible and that will be, uh, we'll, we'll mention them when we reach the difficulties of, of this exam. But ideally, you know, we, we can go through all. So we do that for all of them and record them. Um, one um, advice uh, that I'll mention ahead of time is once you check each dermatome, uh, note it in the file, uh, right away. Don't try to remember there are uh, 28 of them for light touch on right side and left side, and then there are 28 for pin prick on right side and left side. So you won't remember uh, all of them. So yeah, right after each one. Now, the scoring, as we said, will be either 0, 1, or 2. 0 will be when it's absent, 1 will be when the sensation is present, but not exactly um, uh, same. And sometimes patients will say, well, it feels about the same, and we have to further ask them if they um, feel 100% same, exactly normal, or there is some kind of uh, difference due to the injury that they sustained, so then it will be one, so two will be normal. And T, as we said, as I said, was um, in cases when the skin is not accessible due to cast or burn or some other, other reason. Now, sharp and dull is a uh, tiny bit more, more complicated, but it's also straightforward. Uh, same time, so we use pin prick. We first um, uh, test it uh, at the cheek or the forehead, and we apply the sharp um, part of the safety pin or dull, well, one of them first, and the second uh, we do the other. And we say that this is how the sharp sensation and how dull sensation normally feels. Uh, please remember them and let me know if you feel sharp or dull at any at all these different dermatomes as we go. Now, the difference here is um, that we have to do this in, in two steps, the sharp and dull one. We, we have to first uh, identify if they can uh, discriminate these two different sensations from each other. Now, if they do, then we ask them, does the sharp, let's say, at the C3 level, does it feel the same exact way as the sharp at the forehead, or did it feel different? So there is a possibility to, to differentiate these two from each other, but uh, not, it might not feel exactly the same. In that case, it will be scored as one. And if they cannot differentiate them at all, it will be scored as zero. And if they differentiate and it feels exactly normal sharp and normal dull, then it will be a score of two. So that's entire 
um, uh, uh, sensory testing and all, you know, after, on top of this, all you'd need to you know to, to do the entire test is just the dermatomes uh, where they're located and some tricks, of course, which we will uh, discuss later. Now, mu muscle testing is um, and pretty straightforward as well. It starts from zero to five. Um, to, it is uh, similar to um, the, or, or same to the testing of muscles in the uh, standard of care, uh, but there are differences in ages uh, in standard of care, um, particularly by the muscles that are being tested, but I'll discuss muscles later. So Zero is total paralysis. If there is no palpable or traceable, you know, little, little tiny, tiny contraction, that's a zero. If it is, if there is palpable or visible little contraction, that will be a one. Two is active movement as well as three and four and five, but two is only movement uh, with, with the gravity eliminated state. Meaning if I want to flex uh, my forearm, um, I can do it against gravity, or I can do it while elimination, while eliminating the gravity. So in each, each of the muscle has its own uh, sand, uh, um, position where the gravity is eliminated, and that's where we test it. Now three is the active movement full range against the gravity, but um, not against any resistance. So we ask the subject to do the movement, and if they're able to do it with a full range of motion, then score of three. And we actually need to start with the score of three. That's the instruction of the Asia. And then depending if three is present or not, we will either go um, backwards or forwards. So forwards will be a score of four, where we try to restrict that movement. When someone is trying to you know, bring their arm towards their shoulder, we will hold or you know we'll try to restrict them we'll hold their arm and if they can apply minimal resistance it will be score of 5 with maximal resistance will be score so minimal resistance score of 4 maximal resistance will be score of 5 now 5 does not mean they have to be a you know bodybuilder type of or athletic type of uh, strength but it should be a normal type of strength something that you'd expect in a patient who didn't have, or subject who didn't have um, spinal cord injury. Now, NTs come um, in, in place where there is immobilization, severe pain, or the contracture, which um, you know diminishes the range of motion more than 50%. Now, the zero uh, with asterisk and one, two, three, four uh, with asterisk, this, it was the subject to revision of 2019 um, one as um, the rules changed how we use the asterisks. Uh, in past, the asterisks were used um, uh, in a way that we would assign a score that we would think and give it an asterisk. And now we have to, if we are assigning asterisk, we still have to give the score that we are observing, we are getting as a part of the test. Uh, but we have to um, also uh, include information in comment section, which will be uh, important um, uh, later as I'll, I'll show. Now, when the subjects uh, are um, Asia B, which is the, um, incomplete type, sensory incomplete type injury, as we'll discuss, um, it is a, you know, we should go and uh, check other muscles that are non-key muscles and key muscles will follow this. Um, so non-key muscles I have here just as a list, but we'll be focusing on, on the key muscles um, uh, mainly. So for C5, we'll examine the elbow flexors, that's our briceps brachii mainly and brachialis. And we'll check this muscle from score of uh, zero to five by starting with a score of uh, three. So again, we start with three and if three is done, then we can go and check four and five. We don't have to check two, one and zero. So if three is not possible, then we go to two, then we go to one and of course then to zero. For C6 level, we'll check the wrist extensors. For C7, we'll go for the elbow. And the um, one thing to also mention that these images that I'm showing or cartoons, uh, these are from official Asian um, muscle 
training guide, but um, they don't represent the same score. Sometimes they represent score uh, three, sometimes score four. For example, this particular image represents a score of three, how you should check particularly score three. If you place the elbow, if you point the elbow upwards, and extend your forearm, then your uh, triceps are contracting against the um, gravity. In a sitting position, will be similar, putting the elbow upwards. But you know, score of five, of course, we will we will do will apply resistance to to restrict that kind of uh, motion. For C8, we'll check the long toe flexors, and uh, particularly, I want to mention it will be the distal part. Um, of, of the finger that will be checked. And for the T1, we'll check the pinky. So the adductor, abductor digiti minimi for um, evaluation of a T, T1. Here as well, this particular image represents score of four. I picked it because it's uh, easy, more, you know, better demonstrates which particular finger we are going for. And this is just a summary slide of upper extremity muscles. The S5 muscles on each side will be tested. And for the lower extremity, we'll start with the L2 will be hip flexors, L3, the quads for the knee extensors, the L4 will be the uh, ankle dorsiflexions, the tibialis anterior, L5, the long toe uh, extensions or big toe as I usually say it. And S1 is the um, ankle plane reflections here. You, you know, we usually say uh, do a, a ballerina or push a gas pedal or you know, whichever you like you can use. Now, you know, I'll briefly go through the grading system, although this is very important, um, but we'll try to you know, simply, simply uh, group them. Uh, Asia A will be the complete spinal cord injury, meaning um, the sensation in the sacral segments will be absent. So that will be the rule for a complete spinal cord injury. Now this differs um, from the Frankel scale that I mentioned uh, in past. It also had A as a complete, but the sacral segments were not the focus of the uh, Frankel scale while it is in Asia. Now B, C, D, they're all incomplete. B is only sensory incomplete, meaning there is some sensation at S4, S5, um, but there is no motor function either um, at the rectal um, level or uh, three levels below the uh, neurological level of injury. So three levels below neurological injury, there is no motor function will be B. C is uh, when there is motor function three levels below or when there is motor function at the rectal region. As I said, the voluntary anal contraction will also make the exam age C. Now C and D, they're, they're same except that in D, we will be counting the um, scores, the motor scores. So motor scores can, as, as we said, be you know one, two, three, four, five, right? If 50% of scores are three or above, it will be Asia D. And E is the, you know, it says normal, but it's normal that we, you know, we don't detect an injury. Uh, and that's why we say it is going to be normal. So if you don't remember all of this, I know some of you are very experienced with this, but uh, if not, and you try to remember, if you don't remember, remember just main rule. Main rule is noon. Noon uh, equals AISA. A so AIS is the Asia impairment scale. So we can call it AISA or Asia A. Uh, both are used. So noon is Asia A. Now, what is, what is noon? So here's the form uh, that we will zoom into, and you'll see that no voluntary contraction, no sacral four, five sensation. So light touch right and the pinprick on the right, light touch on the left, pinprick on the left, and no DAP, meaning deep anal pressure. Uh, none of them, they are the ones that constitute noon. So just knowing this rule will uh, probably diminish the uh, inaccuracies in Asia uh, uh, hugely. But yeah, so this is the rule, rule number one we want to remember. So noon equals Asia A, which is complete spinal cord injury. And here, are, of course, all the other grades as well. Um, now, what we next think we want to learn how to do is how to determine the NLI. And this is something that I personally don't totally agree with, uh, but um, I'll say why. So first definition, then NLI is neurological level of injury. 
and it is determined by lowest unaffected uh, level. I would personally uh, call it the lowest or, or highest affected level, but this is how uh, the rules are. So lowest unaffected level in the uh, sensory here, if you look at it, um, on the right side will be the uh, C7, C7. So on the C7, you have two and two, two we know is normal, below there are zeros. So, you know, there are two in light touch of prick, meaning their lowest and affected on the right side will be C7. Now on the left side, there is uh, two, two, and two and one, meaning one is affected. So this cannot be NLI anymore. Yeah, so the segment above has to be the NLI, that will be the C6. So left will be C6. Now in the motor scores, it uh, varies, it's there, you know, there, it doesn't vary, it, there is additional rule. Um, if um, the segment uh, has a score of five, but below it has a score of three, four, and five, that three or four can also be considered normal. So the rule is the same, but with additional mini rule. So in this case, on the right side, we have five, five, um, and below there is two, so we will say that C6 will be the correct uh, neurological level on the right side. Now you'll you might ask, what about C2, C3, C4? Well, there are muscles, but we don't check those muscles. And uh, by Asia rule, we assume that they either are normal or abnormal, depending on their equal uh, sensory um, you know, uh, counterpoint. If the, if the sensory is abnormal at C3, we will assume that C3 motor would be also abnormal. So we would count it as a neurological level for motor. So uh, the, the key point here is you don't see motor, um, you look at the sensory and assume that it's same or similar. Um, now on the left side, we have a five and below we have a three and twos all, all the sensory. So we know C2, C3 are fine, C5 and then C6, C6, because it's a three, because it's supported by five from top, this will be considered normal level, meaning this will be the lowest normal level because below is two. So that will be the NLI um, for the left for motor. Now, Overall, NLI is very simple to calculate. You take this four and pick the highest one out of this four, whichever is high, that's your NLI. Now, completeness, I'm sure you all remember the rule. Uh, if you didn't you know before that noon is equal to A, so we see no voluntary contraction, no sacral sensation, no DAP will be Asia A. Now, if there was at least one score of one here, right, or yes, for DAP, it would be then Asia B. If there was one score there, uh, or DAP, and plus either VAC, voluntary contraction, or motor function below the NLI, which we see there is actually, it would have been considered a Asia C. Now to distinguish C and D, again, only thing we need to do is look at NLI and count the muscle scores below them and see which, you know, if the amount of threes, fours and fives are above half or not, or equal, equal or above half. So if they are, threes are above or equal to half, it will be a D. Now, what you see here on the right side is a zone of partial preservation. And uh, as, as mentioned, um, or maybe not mentioned yet, but, so the rules with the, I have mentioned the 2019 revision, we changed the rules of the ZPP. Initially we uh, were uh, recording the ZPPs only for complete patients. Now we also record them when the DAP or VAC uh, is absent, one of them. And it helps to um, uh, increase the value of prognostics showing that higher um, quantity of patients with, or higher amount of patients with, positive ZPPs had higher um, chances of recovery. So now uh, what to do and what not to do. And many of this again will be my, um, my just suggestions and opinions and subject to concerns and 
comment. Uh, but use calculator. Um, so calculator is is amazing tool. Uh, I use it despite um, you know doing a lot of <laughs> a lot of Asia exams. And it, it really, really helps uh, to check if um, your knowledge is correct. I would advise to first try to grade each AJ exam if you'll be performing them and then use the calculator so you check yourself if you did it uh, well or not. And now this is how the calculator looks. It's very user-friendly. You type numbers, it auto-populates and you can easily um, you know, change, it, change them as you go. Now, one very important um, use of the calculator is when you have asterisks. As long as there are comment sections in your original Asia, let's say you were uh, enrolling someone and you got their Asia and it has asterisks and you're, there are no grades. If, if you have any comments, you can plug them in uh, and basically you can you know, just use the raw sentences there, but the asterisks need to have information if they um, um, if the exam was or the muscle was normal or abnormal, and that will help you to grade the Asia. So normal versus abnormal. Now, repeat the verbal consent, even though you already had subject consented, uh, doesn't hurt to ask them if you can touch their, their body. Uh, now, it's very important, actually, in my opinion, where you when you mention the rectal exam, uh, and it's important in um, uh, in um, in the results uh, in in patients either refusing or, or subjects again uh, refusing or non refusing the, the rectal exam so acute patients acute subjects they don't usually refuse um, subjects with chronic SEI may refuse sometimes 10 10 20 percent of times maybe and I think that if you mention the rectal rectal exam uh, while you are starting the Asia and you say, all right, this is what we'll do. We'll do sensory part, motor part and rectal. They tend to hear just rectal. They're like, okay, well, you, wait, you're going. And a lot of people do, do you know, consent uh, to Asia and they don't know that rectal exam is part of it. And the reason for it is that a lot of examiners do the Asia without rectal exam, which um, should not be considered a full exam at all. Now, even if uh, subjects do refuse to uh, rectal exam, uh, it's advised that you develop this kind of a form. This is just a form. I'm not going to go through it, but basically, it uh, you know allows you to ask questions about the uh, rectal um, sensation information, and it's not you know good substitute, but it, it is a theoretical substitute. Now. Um, the safety uh, pin. So not all pins are equally sharp and uh, I'm uh, advised to be careful and test on yourself. I do test it a lot on, on myself to see and sometimes they can be very painful. The issue is that uh, subjects might not feel it and you might push it uh, too much and get a little uh, blood drop. I have not uh, had that case with my exams, but I've um, I've witnessed, I'll say that. So the, yeah, don't, don't use 90 degrees, use 30 to 40 degrees of an angle if you can, and um, try to avoid performing the Asia exams in patients who are intubated or have tracheostomy. Now there are ways, sometimes you have no other option. You have a deadline has to be done on that day. Uh, communication is the key, but yes, verbal communication is the best, but you can use different ways, I don't know, winking and uh, asking, you know, trying to wave. It will be hard, especially in acute SCI when there is the uh, collar in place and uh, tube as well. So it's, it's, it's going to be tough. It, it will, overall, it affects the quality of exam, of course, but sometimes you have no other option uh, unless you do, you know, develop a protocol so that you allow yourself time, which is something I also advise. Um, now, repeating each test is very important, especially with the pin prick, and you have to apply 80% rule. What this rule is that subjects' responses, they're not uh, always um, same. Sometimes they'll say, okay, I feel it, I, feel, I don't feel it, or, or sharp, then you do sharp again, and they say dull. Now, how do you know what's correct or not? You apply the 90% or, sorry, 80% rule. If it's correct 80% of times, then you count it. And sometimes you'll have to repeat even the rectal exam. I wish good luck convincing subjects. Some of them, some of them don't mind at all. 
um, and uh, have heard even jokes uh, about them. One subject was at 72 hours Asia, I asked if um, the way to ask it is, uh, is it okay if I uh, examine your bottom? That's how we are advised to ask them. And one subject said, um, uh, before or um, after you buy me a dinner, and I really remember that as it was a 72-hour exam, and, you know, just 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 after the injury. Um, now, so uh, yes, re repetition is good, but you shouldn't become this guy that's uh, Sisyphus rolling the boulder uphill, uh, the um, king who was punished for cheating death, um, and uh, now has to roll the boulder for eternity. So the point is, uh, you know, at some point you have to make a judgment. You should not overwhelm the subject and, you know, go with, with, with your decision, with your judgment. If you need, there is no shame, discuss with colleagues, repeat the exam, explain to the subject that, you know, this is very important. A lot of inclusion criteria are dependent on this. All papers mention um, the Asia, many, not all, but of course. So um, now one more thing is that if you uh, are not sure uh, about the positive or negative, can't make a decision, right? End of the world. Uh, be conservative, that's my my advice. If there was spinal cord injury, it's a higher chance that something is affected than it's recovered. If it does recover later, you'll be able to uh, notice it. It might become more consistent. If it's halfway consistent, I don't necessarily re recommend um, you know assigning a score if you're not sure about that score. Um, now, and one thing I also advise is to explain the results uh, to the subjects as we, you know, we do uh, this long exam and after the exam, they end up sometimes not, not knowing wh what all this means. And one particular case I want to also share about is when you, and, you know, give, give an example about is when you have uh, Asia A subjects, be very careful what you, um, what do you explain and how you explain it? And, you know, especially young subjects, not necessarily only young subjects, but with who don't know if they have age grade uh, A, B, C, or don't know anything, you know, about this grading, but hear about a complete SEI and incomplete SEI. Um, be careful how you deliver the information about completeness. And, you know, I had a case when I said, you know, by Asia standards, this is considered complete and had a case where subject, you know, young subject cried and other was very emotional as well. So I learned uh, not to be that straightforward and to explain a little bit about it. And first one thing that I, I usually say is that uh, it does not mean when subject is age A that their spinal cord is transected, right? It's not a uh, totally severed cord. It means that by this exam, there is no sensation in, in rectal region. That's the only thing it means. Now, yes, there is prognostic value, but this uh, alleviates the you know, toughness of delivering the, the uh, information. And uh, finally, we move to the errors and difficulties. And you know, the exam is somewhat complex and complexity can lead to errors. And it's not just the complexity, but time pressure, as I mentioned, some, you know, Asia is used or in this case used as in, in inclusion criteria sometimes. And, uh, especially in acute SCI, time pressure can play a role, workload, especially when residents are uh, asked to perform the Asia exams while they have to take care of 40 other patients. Uh, Asia exam needs a lot of time. Sometimes it's over an hour. So you have to have a person who has that one hour uh, language, other communication barriers, obviously, as mentioned before, and interruptions. The Asia exam needs you know, focus. Um, and of course, the uh, lack of training can contribute to to the uh, quality of exams. So now we go to errors, and this is the time we'll ask audience to participate, give your opinions, uh, and first we'll mention the misconception: the injury is cervical. As you can see there, there are affected upper limb functions uh, for you know, you know four two zeros. And then sensation is present all the way on the trunk, TLT12. So if you look at this, you know, graphic here as well, the yellow means it's it's present, but it's it's altered. So Asia must be incomplete. What do you think? Uh, what is the Asia here? You can either say 
you know, A, B, C, D, E, or complete or incomplete? What do you think it is? Please type or speak up. Okay, Linda said, hey, what about others? All right, so uh, we had one response, but correct response. That is that is correct. It's, it is an A, and it is an A because of the noon, right? So we have no VAC, no DAP, and zeros. Therefore, the Asia is, uh, of course, A. Now, what happens in, in this exam? This exam um, is actually my own error that I am uh, had... Um, uh, uh, that occurred when I was examining a patient with a lumbar injury and it was new to me. I was new also to the exams. So I promised myself I'd show this uh, in this presentation. Uh, so what, what happened here is that um, there was a lumbar injury, there were, but there were uh, motor um, scores present. So the, the person had motor function in lower extremity. Um, there, yeah, their sensation at S4, S5 segment was also present. So that already told me that the, this was not a complete injury. And due to presence of the motor scores on lower extremities, I assumed that it would have been an Asia C. But um, what about Linda or others? <laughs> what, do you, what do you think? Would, it, would this be an Asia C? Or what, it, what would it be? No guesses? So, okay, th th this one will be an Asia B. Now, uh, the reason why this one will be Asia B is, yes, uh, there are motor function, uh, mo there is motor function preserved in lower extremities, but that's where the neurological level of injury is. So neurological level of injury here will be the L1. So if, there, if somebody injured L1, and they, yes, have sacral sparing of sensory function, but no voluntary, voluntary L contraction, or the motor function is three levels below the NLI, uh, that means that they will not have motor incomplete injury, but rather just sensory incomplete. So that's what happened to me. So that's an example of Asia B versus uh, C. And uh, there's another uh, misconception. This is um, when this is a tough one uh, when when the rectal exam is done and there is um, again lower either lower thoracic or lower uh, lumbar um, injuries. What happens is sometimes um, examiner might feel pressure on their digit with um, um, because of either rectal tone or because of um, contraction of the abdominal muscles. And that does not necessarily mean that the voluntary anal contraction is present. So that can also, you know, um, be an example of Asia B while someone is kind of felt pressure on the finger, but there is no motor function three levels below NLI uh, and the VAC cannot be counted. So this takes a little bit of experience. Um, now, what do you think is the Asia grade uh, here? I'll go through it. We can maybe do it together. So if there is, let's say, the sensory test, you see the twos and one we know is not normal anymore. So we see that on the right side, the sensory will be what? Will be the um, uh, C8. Uh, left side will be also C8. Uh, Motor-wise, um, we're doing fine on the C8 and the T1, but um, we'll have the T2. When, when we have to assume that the motor isn't no, normal already. And for the, um, uh, the AIS grade, we, say, we see that sacral sparing is totally present. There is VAC, there is DAP, it's, it's, it's all there. So what we have to count next is 
Okay, it's gonna be motoring complete. Will it be motoring complete C or D? And again, we do it by counting motor scores below the NLI. NLI, as we said, is C8, right? So below NLI, there is T1 and the lower extremity. So five, five, that's two, five, that's three, four, five, six. So six of them are scores three or higher. And then six of them, uh, L4, L5, S1, on each side are not three or higher, meaning it's still 50%, so the Asia should be Asia D. Now, this is probably the most common pitfall. What happens here is that uh, people remember, uh, don't remember sometimes the rule of the um, three supported by five on top. So what it, that rule is, if motor score is normal and below the normal motor score has, so five below, it has three, four, uh, or five, obviously, it will also be considered normal. So on the right side here, the uh, C5 will be the motor score, but on the left side, you see the fives, and then from T2 to L1, we have no motor scores, but we have to assume that they are either normal or abnormal according to sensory tests, which in this case will tell us that they are normal. So L1 is also normal. Now L2 has a score of three, meaning on, in this case, L2 will be the neurological level of injury. So this will also be considered normal because we have to assume there are fives all the way here, um, theoretical fives by Asia's uh, rules, of course. So now a few of the difficulties involve, you know, of course, uh, spasticity, which limit the range of motion. Uh, acute phase ages are really hard to, to do, but um, very, very are very important for you know study designs and also for inclusion criteria. Intubation is something that I would definitely try to avoid. Um, and non-traumatic SCIs that happen that you know some subjects come in, they think they, or maybe they don't think, but you know we we still they still try to join the community and they have Arnold Chiari or Gillian Barre or. Uh, transverse myelitis, I have examined all these subjects and they looked, you know, uh, the exam results looked somewhat like the um, SCI um, results, but of course they were having different causes. And uh, one uh, big difficulty is that subjects' willingness to perform well, we always have to consider that sometimes subjects come with family members, they want to kind of demonstrate that they're doing well and will not try to deceive you, but will try to uh, guess this course. So you have to have a lot of um, uh, techniques and tricks in order to sort of trick subjects sometimes so that you get an accurate uh, response. Now, uh, usually nobody remembers about the Asia, their NLI. They do um, remember about their vertebral injury, what their neurosurgeon told them or what they heard in the hospital. Uh, nobody will remember about ZPP. Sometimes subjects will know about ABC, but no, no, not always. And the point of this slide is just to, um, if you do the full Asia, please uh, explain to the subjects, educate them, let them know what this stands for. Um, and, uh, you know, th that could serve useful for them to qualify in different studies and also to, um, um, you know, have an idea of the changes that they might experience uh, later. So that is my talk. I want to, of course, thank uh, especially Dr. Gass for helping with uh, the presentation and information in it, Dr. Dietrich and Levy for all the opportunities to do all these uh, exams. Uh, Dr. Nash here as well, pointing at me. Um, it was, um, it was this, uh, idea for this uh, uh, presentation, so thank you for that. Also need to thank Katie because uh, her and I, we spent, uh, I don't know how many countless hours going over ages together and we reviewed each Asia her and I or I did uh, together. So that helped with training a lot. Uh, thank you for Danielle with helping to get all these ages done. And Neil, uh, to uh, for, for patients with me when we go over ages together and my mother who actually initially was the first one who who trained me to to do this this ages back in past uh, and also of course the entire Miami project team uh, thank you very much so uh, we'll take questions if you have any so Neil or uh, George I'd like to start 
uh, with a comment. Sorry, I said, Neil, I'm actually using her computer. Uh, That's so I think that you did a great job. Um, and the only comment I wanted to add is the critical importance of doing the exam right and recording it right. Uh, recently, George uh, has been involved with the data clean that's going back, in some cases, uh, more than a decade. And so we're, when we go to use the data, uh, the INSCI data, we're entirely reliant on its accuracy. And to, if we have inaccurate data or if we have data that contains indicators that you know, wasn't, uh, it's inconsistent, uh, we often have to reject that data. So I just wanna say that if you're gonna get involved in doing the exam, please uh, you know, try to, to, to do it accurately. And maybe as George has suggested, you know, confer with him or another colleague to ensure that it's, it's accurate. And the other thing is to do a complete exam. It's important uh, that the exam is complete. George decided not to talk about the uh, e uh, INSCI, which is an abbreviated exam, but for our purposes in research, the full exam is very important. So thanks very much for doing that, George. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.